How are we doing this morning? Good, good, good. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. The peace, peace of God. Awesome series, awesome series by the peace of God. Amen. Amen. We feeling all right today? Good. For those of y'all who don't know me, my name is Christian. I get to preach here once every month, and I'm just such, so privileged and honored to be able to do that. And uh, just grateful for this church, grateful to be here. And man, it's always awesome coming in here. I was talking to Mr. Freddie this morning, just looking around, saying on Labor Day weekend, packed out in here. That's how you know God's moving in this church and God's breathing. The rain can't stop us. The vacation weekend can't stop us. We packed in here, ready to receive and worship God. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for bringing us here today, Lord. God, I just pray for each and every person under the sound of my voice, God. No matter how we walked in here, God, thank you that we're going to leave changed, God, refreshed, Lord, laying our burdens down at your feet this morning, Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Lord, like Ms. Bonnie said, God, for that peace of God which surpasses all understanding, Lord, that would guard our hearts and minds in you, Jesus. God, we fix our focus on you, God, we fix our thoughts upon you, God. You say in Isaiah, God, you will keep him in perfect peace because he trusts in you, Jesus. Lord, so we thank you, we trust you this morning, we praise you. And Lord, we're just so grateful for this win we're going to have tonight. In Jesus' name, everybody say, amen. 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 Awesome. Anybody brought their Bibles to church this morning? If you have your Bible, raise it up. Raise it up. Anybody? Anybody brought their Bibles? Okay. All right. Anybody brought the cell phone Bible? Raise it up. Cell phone Bible. It's a lot more of us. It's a lot more of us. Amen. If not, we have a big Bible on the screen today. A huge Bible for everybody to read. But I brought my Bible this morning. I can barely hold it. It's a big Bible. Everybody say, make big Bible school again. Here we go. Psalms 27. I'm going to read a lot of scripture this morning, so just, man, hang in there. It's going to be a lot of good stuff. I've realized the word of God is better than any preaching because man can preach for itself. Amen? So we're going to hear from the word this morning. So here it is in Psalms 27. It's from David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh and my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp me against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that this I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. Somebody say joy. joy. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me also. Answer me. When you said to me, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face away from me and do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave nor forsake me, O God, of my salvation. When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries. Adversaries, For false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. And this is what we're going to focus on today, right here, this verse. This is David, King David, saying this. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. and He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Look at the person next to you and say, wait. 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 In honor of this sermon, it's going to be about three hours. We're going to practice waiting today. No, just kidding. But wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Amen. Somebody said amen. Three hours. Everybody else said, no way. No, I'm playing. But look, um, wait on the Lord. The, the title of today's sermon is Wait on God. Wait on God. So King David, we all know King David, he fought Goliath, fought that big giant. He started out as a shepherd boy. A lot of scholars say when he was about 15 years old, that's when he was shepherding in the fields. And God promised to him from, through a prophet, Jesse, that he would anoint him, right? And he would become king at a, when he was a teenager. He would be a king one day. David waited 15 years later till he became king. He would have lost heart unless he had believed that he would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. There is plenty of people that lose heart in this Christian life because they don't think God's working. They don't think God's doing anything. Man, it's so easy to fall into that trap because so often God will have us wait. We pray prayer sometimes and it seems like nothing's happening. We hear a word from God, are you going to do this? You're going to do that and nothing seems to happen. 
We don't realize all throughout the Bible we see God had people in waiting seasons and seasons where nothing really seemed to happen and seasons where it was rough and seasons where there was trials and we had to go through things and wait. But after the waiting season, they all received the promises of God. So powerful. It's all from waiting on God. Anybody here like fast food? Okay, raise your hand. Praise God. Anybody here like smoked food, smoked brisket, smoked cold pork? Okay, a lot more of us. Okay, amen. Anybody smokes anything in here? Food? Smokes food? Anybody? Yeah. Or if you smoke other things. Let's be honest in church. No. Listen, listen. No, amen. But um, where was I? Smoke foods. Okay, listen. When you're smoking a brisket, it takes about eight hours, ten hours, you know. Smoking a chicken takes a long time. We got my dad a smoker for his uh, Father's Day last year. We've been smoking all kinds of stuff. And, um, man, it takes a long time to smoke a nice food and get nice, tender, and good, get it right. Why? Because it's a process. If you try to rush the process, some people do, man, you'll get a tough, unappetitable, ungood food. The same way with us spiritually. God has us in a waiting season sometimes because he's doing something in a waiting It's not just for no good. Oftentimes, we want to rush it. We want to see, man, what we can do in our strength, speed it up. But God's saying, man, let's wait in this season. Let me strengthen you. Let me build you. Let me put things in you. And on the other side of waiting, it's a nice tender brisket a lot of times, a nice tender roast, right? Man, it's always worth the wait. Amen? Amen. Amen. Wait on the God. Good things come to those who wait. People in the Bible who waited. I was studying a few of these people. One of the people, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis. Genesis chapter 12. Abraham. Father Abraham had many, and many sons had father. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. All right, so here it is. Genesis 12, Abraham saying this. God promises Abraham at 75 years old. And I think it's so cool how God actually puts the age in here, because I think he, every single part of the Bible is important, right? And I think this is one of those important parts where he wanted us to see how old he was, okay? So here it is, Abraham, uh, Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. There's the promise right there. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in him and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And here's a cool part right here. So Abraham departed as the Lord has spoken to him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Okay? 75 years old when he receives this promise in Genesis 12. 75 years old. We jump over a few chapters into Genesis chapter 21. And we see Abraham's receiving this promise. Okay? Now Abraham was 100 years old. 25 years after God spoke to him. 25 years after he said, I will make you a great nation. 25 years. That's a long time. I'm 24 years old. I haven't been long enough to see a whole promise like that. 25 years old. This is, what, this is when he receives the promise. Now, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. This was a joyful laugh, unlike the laugh uh, in earlier chapters. She also said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. God is faithful to his promises. It doesn't mean that right when God promises something, right there the next minute you're going to get it, right? Sometimes it's a process because God's doing something in the waiting. He's doing something in the waiting. Skip over a few chapters. A lot of Bible verses today. Y'all hanging in there? Y'all like it? Bible verses? Y'all like the Bible? Amen. Here it is. A few chapters after in Genesis 37, we see another man of God who waited. All throughout the Bible, people who waited. Genesis 37. His name is Joseph. Joseph, being 17 years old, still a teenager, he was feeding the flock with his brothers. Where he had a dream, God said he was going to lead and rule and do all these things and be a leader. And then Joseph waited, we see, 13 years later before he walked into this dream. You skip over a few, few chapters. Chapter 41, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. 13 years before he walked into that promise. Abraham, 25 years. Joseph, 13 years. Waiting on the promises of God to be fulfilled. They hear the promise, but then there's years of waiting. Yeah. All right? We see Moses, another famous guy. Anybody's heard of Moses? Man, led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses, he heard a promise from God that I'm going to set these people free through you. Man, I'm going to use you to set these people free. 40 years ago, and Moses got to see the promised land. God kept his promise. Jesus waited 30 years before starting his ministry to save all humanity. Man, we serve a God of sometimes a God who serves in waiting, right? 
when we're going to get the promise of God, but it takes time to wait. Everybody say, wait on God. Wait on, wait on God. God. And I'm so thankful for the waiting process, man, because God does something in us. Sometimes it don't feel like you're doing anything, but God's working even when we don't see it. Getting all the junk out of us, getting all the man, character flaws, all this thing. A lot of time, and actually for everybody, God puts a calling on all of our lives. There's callings, there's great plans, there's great big things. But oftentimes, God won't let us fully walk in a calling because our character doesn't match up with the calling. Wow. Our character don't match up with the calling. Wow. And oftentimes, if he let us walk in a calling beforehand, it would crush us because we weren't ready to walk into the thing that God had for us. Amen? The calling of God that he has in life is so big, it's so great. Oftentimes, we jump into it beforehand. That's why we see a lot of preachers and people and business people fall into all these different things because the character didn't match the calling. Man, what's the heart motive? How's your heart? What are you doing inside? Man, are you getting to work? What's your motive behind doing the things that we're doing, right? God wants to use, man, pure vessels, people. And sometimes we let people walk into the calling beforehand. It'll crush them. It'll crush them. A faith that hasn't been tested is a faith that can't be trusted. A faith that hasn't been tested is a faith that can't be trusted. Man, has God tested you? I know for me, he has. I know for most of us in this room, God's tested us. Different things, different trials. Man, seeing how we react, right? A faith that hasn't been tested can't be trusted. No opposition? I don't know if anything's going on in your life, right? That you do anything great for God. Oftentimes, when you're doing great things for God, there's going to be opposition. There's going to be things that come against you. Most times I've seen in my life, there's going to be things, thoughts, attitudes that you're going to have to fight through and push through and trust God and say, God, I'm not going to go on my feelings. I'm going to walk by faith, not by sight, and trust you anyway. And on the other side of that, we'll see the promise of God in our life. That doesn't mean waiting's going to be fun, though. It's not what I mean waiting's going to be fun. Sometimes it'll be awkward. It could be weird, right? It could be kind of boring. Like when I sip this water, it's kind of weird. It's just silence in here. Just let's try it out. <laughs> My mouth's dry. Waiting ain't always fun. We see a lot of people today, man, who don't want to wait. I don't want to wait. Back in the day, man, Wi-Fi was slow. I remember when Wi-Fi was first coming out. I mean, we had to go travel to my neighbor's house to get the Wi-Fi because my mom and dad didn't have Wi-Fi at the house at that time. So we go sit on my front, my neighbor's front porch, Bobby Rosani, to go play in our Kindles and uh, just go play on the Wi-Fi. And it was so slow. By the time you look up something, you go make yourself a sandwich, take a nap, and come back, and your results will be on the screen. That's how slow it was, right? We don't like waiting. We don't like waiting. But we serve a God in the waiting. And waiting is not always fun. There's so many Christians that don't want to wait. But the truth is, I've said it before, the Christian life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Man, it's not just going, getting all hyped up and getting fired up. That's part of it. But, it's, man, it's the long game. It's staying this thing for the long run. It's not just going to a Christian concert, conference, watching a move, movie about God, a sermon. get y'all fired up and go on this little streak and then come back down and, you know, or getting a Christian tattoo, going to Bible seminary and going to get fired up for God. I've seen it. I've seen it with a few of people I was very close to, and then they fall away from God. Why? Because the Christian life isn't a playground. It's a battleground. It's a battleground. Man, it takes grit to serve God. People think once when you become a Christian or once when you start serving God, everything in your life just falls into place. And true, partially, God has good plans for your life, but it also comes with trials and tribulations you have to fight through. Like anybody else, we don't have an excuse or a cop-out. We just have Jesus as our hope, and we can get it through it, right? The bigger the battle, the bigger God we serve. Jesus Christ, he can get us through it. It takes grit to serve God, especially when the things of the world get tempting. Man, it's so easy to talk like the world, to act like them, to party like them, to drink like them, to do what they do, say what they do, joke like they joke, watch what they joke. It's so much easier to do that, right? So much easier to do that. Sin is fun for a season. I'll admit it. Sin is fun for a season. But when it's fully birthed, it gives birth to death. When it's fully conceived, it gives birth to death. Moses talks about this in the Bible in Genesis in Hebrews 11, 24 through 26, uh, they talk about Moses. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. This is powerful. He cho choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Wow. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. It's fun for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. If you're driving on the road and you're constantly looking in your rearview mirror, you're going to crash and not get anywhere. Man, he looked to the reward. How do you make it in a Christian life? How do you make it when you're waiting on God and when it's tough and when it's hard and you feel like you're doing all the right things, but other people that aren't doing the right things, they're flourishing and they're getting money and all this stuff? How do you keep... Your faith, 
You look to the end goal. You look to the long goal. We look to the prize that's already marked out for us, eternity with Jesus. We know how the story ends. You look to the long goal. Longevity is rare nowadays. It's rare. Anybody doing anything for an extended period of time, it's rare nowadays. You look at divorce rates right now. I think I saw a poll recently. It was like 50% of all marriages end in divorce. Terrible. Terrible. It's, man, it's because a lot of people uh, think love is a feeling. Not a, you know, they think it's a feeling, but it's a choice at the end of the day. It's fun at first, you know, when you're going on dates and there's butterflies and all this stuff. And, man, so great. But once when that person becomes a little annoying, it starts thinking a little bit. They start farting in the bed as you. Um, not talking from <laughs> personal experience, but... Now, of course, not my wife. She ain't here, so I can make jokes. But um, love's a choice. It ain't a feeling. It's a choice. It's not a feeling. You have to choose to love. The same way, man, you have to choose to serve God. Sometimes the goosebumps ain't going to be there on Monday morning when you're going into work. Like you experience worship, it's all good. It's easy to serve God and come talk and put on the church thing when we get in church and all together. But when you're in the world, man, it's hard to go out there sometimes. Man, you have to choose. We walk by faith, not by sight. Even when it seems like nothing's working or going on, you have to choose to serve God. It's a choice at the end of the day. It's not just a feeling. You have to choose, even when it's hard or when it's tough. That's why I love Pastor Derek and Bonnie. Been in ministry for 40 years, I believe, right? 40 years. That's rare. That is rare nowadays to be in ministry or do anything for that long. 40 years of serving God and leading this parish, man. Thank you all so much. It's, it's rare. Thank you. Yeah, y'all can clap. Thank you all so much. Powerful. Anything for that long. 40, especially in ministry, you know, with the ins and outs. Praise God. So look, what do we do? What do we do? How do we wait on God, practically speaking? Let's look in Hebrews 6, 9 through 12. A few chapters before 11, 6, 9 through 12. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love. God's not going to forget about you. What you have shown toward his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Look towards the prize that you do not become sluggish. Here it is. Don't become sluggish, but imitate those through faith and patience inherit the promises. How do you receive the promise of God? How do you see what God has for you in this life? What it comes through? Two things. Faith and patience. Faith and patience. What is faith? Believing even when it seems like nothing's really working out, nothing's going on. It's believing before you actually see it take place. How do you receive the promise? Believing without seeing it all the way at first, having faith and patience. Man, letting God do his thing. God's timing is better than, his own, than our own, right? God's never early. He's never late, but he's always right on time. Amen. Always right on time. Never early, never late, not, not on, always right on time. And his timing's not our timing. It's not our time, but his timing is so much better. It's so much better. I believe one of the biggest reasons why we don't wait is because we get tired. Like this verse says, we become sluggish. We get tired. Anybody gets tired in here? I get tired every time I hear my alarm go off in the morning. This morning, I snoozed it a few times. I'm telling you. I'm like, man, here it comes. We get tired. We're tired. And especially when we're waiting on the things of God to come into our life. Sometimes we get tired. It's normal. The Bible tells us this. Don't become sluggish. Don't become sluggish. Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary in doing good, for we're in due season. When is that due season? When the season's due. When the season's due. Don't grow weary. Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. If we don't give up. It's not about doing everything perfect, doing everything right. It's about not giving up. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31, talking about being tired and sluggish and worn out. Here, here's what God tells us. Have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? He neither faints nor is weary. Praise God. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Have you been tired? Have you been worn out? Man, he's going to increase your strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What's the promise? That you're not going to grow weary. You're not going to faint. Man, when you wait on the Lord, when you wait on God. If you don't hear nothing else today, hear that. Wait on God. Wait on God. He's faithful. He's done it once before in the past. He'll do it again. Amen? Wait on God. 
I've been in times in my life where I've been disappointed. We all have. What's disappointment mean? It's a missed appointment. Missed appointment. You think one thing's going to happen one way in your life, and you're excited, you're getting ready, man, it seems like it's going to happen. It doesn't turn out the way you thought it would be. Disappointed. You pray a prayer, it don't turn out the way you thought it would be. Disappointed. Man, there's missed appointments in our life. I've been in places where my life when I prayed, and I felt like my prayers hit the ceiling, bounced right back down, being honest with you. Been there before. Man, disappointed. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, what Proverbs says. But a desire, when it fully comes, is a tree of life. It's a tree of life. There it is. And God will not let those prayers return void. But sometimes it's not the same time that we expect. So, man, keep the faith. Keep the fight. When you're growing tired, wait on God. Trust in God. Go back to the promises of God. Go back to his word. We're about to get into that in a minute. God is bigger than time. He's going to renew your strength and build your, build your strength in the waiting. So what do we do when we feel like we're tired of waiting on God and we feel like giving up, throwing in the towel? Number one is this. You have to remember the reward and remember the promises of God. Remember the reward and the promises of God. This is what Moses did in that verse in Hebrews 11. He'd rather suffer with the people of God and instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin, looking to the reward. What's the reward? Man, it's Jesus being able to, in his presence, no tears, in his presence, complete peace in his presence. Man, that's the reward that we get as Christians. Looking towards the reward. If you have your Bibles, again, I want you to turn to Joshua chapter 4. Talking all about looking to the reward, remembering what God's done. Powerful, powerful verse. Here it is. Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Y'all got it? Here we go. And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men in the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. God's people are crossing into the promised land. Forty years of waiting, they're finally into the promised land. This is what God tells them to do. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. 12, 12 tribes, 12 stones. And this is why they're going to set up these stones. This is why. They're just going into the promised land, setting up 12 stones of remembrance. That this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. They shall be a memorial for the children of Israel forever. In our life, we need the same thing. We need the stones of remembrance. God says, set up these stones because so often in life, it can be really easy to forget what I've done. I mean, I've woken you up this morning. I've blessed you. I've given you all these things. It can be really easy to forget what I've done. So set up these stones of remembrance so that way one day when your kids look back and say, God's done it before, he'll do it again. Yeah. God's done it before, he'll do it again. Hebrew says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We serve a God that's still in a miracle working business today, man. Miracles left and right. We serve a God that's not dead. He's alive, man. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he's done it once before in the past, he will do it again. Yes. That's a promise. So, man, wait on God. Remember what God's done. He's faithful. He started a work in your life. He will complete it. Somebody comes and plants a seed. Another person waters. Another person harvests. Sometimes you don't see all three take place, but God's working even when we don't get it. Yes. If we understood it all, we would be God. He wouldn't. It takes a faith aspect, right? Without faith... It's impossible to please God. Yeah. Without faith, it's impossible to wait on God. Yeah. God's doing something in the waiting. He's doing something when everything don't seem to make sense. If he's done it once, he'll do it again. Yeah. Amen. amen, amen. Okay, here we go. Number three, walk in the spirit. This is a big one. Everybody look at the person next to you and say, walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. All right. Walk in the spirit. Galatians 5, 16 through, 16 through 25. We have another nice chunk of scripture. Here it is. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the, uh, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envies, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Y'all thought I could have get faster. Watch out. I'm coming for y'all. No, here it comes. 
Like beforehand, just a told you, a bunch of bad stuff. That's what we are in our flesh, just a bunch of bad stuff. Anything bad doesn't line up with the Word of God. Here, there it is. But this is the main point here. But the fruit of the Spirit is this. This is how you walk in the Spirit. You want these things. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. That's waiting on God. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I heard this really, really cool thing about this recently. A good, good way of remembering it. I don't know if it's going to help you or not, but it helped me. Is the first three fruits of the Spirit is one syllable. Love, joy, peace. The second is two syllables. Long-suffering, kindness, goodness. Uh, the third is three syllables. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Ah, uh, yeah. If it, if it helps you, great. If not, you know, that's just a weird thing. Forget about it. You know what I mean? But help me. So here it is. Fruit of the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Do not fulfill the lust. Lust. Of the flesh. Don't feel the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. I heard this story about this guy who fought dogs. Anybody here fought dogs before? Okay, nobody. Great. I haven't either. It's bad. Um, yeah, bad joke. Anyway, but there's this guy who uh, fought dogs, right? And this guy here fought dogs. It's not a true story, but it's just an analogy. And this guy was fighting dogs, and they had all these people betting on them, and they had um, they had these dogs that they bet on. And, you know, this guy came up to him, and the guy that was running dog, he always bet on the winning dog. He always bet on the winning dog, and that dog would always win, the winning dog. He always knew which dog was going to win. And this guy came up to him, and he said, man, how do you know which dog's going to win in this fight? And he said, well, the dog I want to win, I feed in the morning. The dog I want to lose, I make sure he has no food in the morning. I was like, huh, okay. So the guy was like, all right, it makes sense, you know. And I was thinking about that story, and I thought about the dog that has food is going to win. The dog that he feeds is going to win. The dog that he starves is going to die. And it's the same way with us spiritually. There's two dogs going at it, at it every single day. The dog that you feed is going to win. The dog that you starve is going to die. Man, you feeding your spirit, the things of the spirit, the things of God. Man, the fruits of the spirit. You're feeding yourself with the word of God, with praise, worship, coming to church. That dog's going to win. Your spirit's going to win. You starving the things of the flesh, making a choice. I'm not going to stay here and scroll on social media. I'm not going to go and gossip about that person. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to feed the things of the flesh. That dog will die. What you feed grows. What you starve dies. Amen. What you feed in your life grows. What you starve dies. Look. If you're single in this room, like, I mean, I wasn't until a few years ago, right? Man, you want to get into a relationship, start feeding yourself, man, what it looks like to be a good husband. What it looks like to be a good wife. Man, instead of focusing on what, instead of focusing on what, you know, a, a person I want, all the things I want, then how do, how do I turn it to me? How can I get better? Right. Instead of pointing the finger at everybody else, how can I get better in this situation? Instead of gossiping about them, how about I pray for them? Man, if putting a finger, instead of pointing, putting it right back at you, how can I do this better? And taking ownership. We're not called to be victims, but victors. Man, taking ownership of the situation and saying, you know what? I can, I can do what I can do, but I can't control what anybody else can do. Right. You know, I can have self-control, control myself, and I can wait on God and trust in him, and everything else is up to God. So we have a choice to make. What are we going to feed today? Are we going to feed the spirit, man, or are we going to feed the flesh? Right. Two of them are fighting every single day. What are we going to feed, man? Let's wake up and feed the spirit, man. Man, make sure we're doing good, man. Self-care, talking to God, spending time with him, spending time in his presence. Not waiting on God ultimately stunts the big plans God wants to do in our life. Ephesians 3, 20, 21 says this. I'm closing up. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church of Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. One of my favorite verses. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Man, any dream, any plan, any good thing you want to come in your life, God wants to do far above that. Yeah. Far above that. Man, those things that you're waiting on God to accomplish, God wants to even do more than that in your life. Whether it's a business thing, a relationship thing, man, a, a choice, I don't know what it is, but God wants to do more. He wants to do better. If you do it in your natural strength, it's not a God dream. Some of the God dreams that we have are so big, so impossible that we need supernatural strength to accomplish them. God wants us to lean on them, man. God wants us to face impossible situations. Why? Because that's when he can step in and work. Whether it's a sickness, whether it's a financial thing, whether it's a relational thing, man, whatever it is, God wants us to wait on him and trust in him and watch how he can make it work out. It'll be a testimony for him. Give other people hope. Amen? Amen. Amen. In your season of waiting, don't worry. God's working on your behalf, man. He's strengthening you. He's encouraging. I want to encourage you with this today. Man, faith and patience. Walk in faith. Walk in patience. Even when it seems like God's not working, he's working. Man, he's a way maker. He's a healer. Even when we don't feel it, even when we don't believe it, God is working, and he's working for our good. All we have to do is, man, trust him. 
lean not on our understanding, put our faith and our full hope in him, our confidence in him. I mean, everything's going to work out like he says in his word. Amen? Yes. Now let me pray for y'all. Jesus, thank you so much for this um, church. God, y'all can all stand to y'all feet. Thank you so much for this church, Lord. I thank you just for this word today, God. Thank you for all the scripture, God. Thank you that this seed is landed upon good soil today, Lord. God, thank you that your word is alive, powerful, and active, God. That's all we need at the end of the day. So we take your word as it is, God, and we believe it, God. Your word is enough, Lord. So we put our hope and our faith and our trust in you and in your word, God. And we choose to wait on you this day, God. I pray just for faith. In patience, no matter what trial, what situation, God, that we'd wait on you, trust in you, God, and know you're going to work on our behalf, God. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.